Morning, Southside. <clears throat> I'd also like to welcome our guests. Grateful to have anyone here uh, visiting to worship our holy God together. Um, just a quick announcement. Um, Brittany Everson is going to be outside afterwards. We're going to partner with Colorado Life Initiative and some other churches in the area. There's a ballot measure they're trying to get on to the 2024 ballot. Uh, it's going to be persons protected under law that all men, women, children, uh, uh, and regardless, my writing, regardless of the stage of development or class or sex from conception unto death to protect life from its initiation uh, to, the, to the very end. And they're going to be collecting signatures out there afterwards. So I want to encourage you to, if you see them, to go ahead and fight for the unborn. A uh, quick report on Westside Bible Church. I wasn't able to share last week because we were running so far behind, but I was able to visit two weeks ago, and I believe Brian was there last week, and just God is doing beautiful things in that church plant. My heart was overwhelmed with uh, just the, the outreach, the, the bonding of the community and the unity and the preaching of the gospel. So just keep praying for, for that church, uh, beautiful things that God's doing there. Well, this morning, I'm going to finish up my season of freelancing. So I, I think uh, what I learned from this is don't give me vacation. It's taken me four months to share what happened on my vacation. So uh, no more vacations for Pastor Murphy. Uh, but fittingly, we're going to finish up our study. Uh, this, we've been looking at abiding in Jesus Christ and what that means. And, and that's what we've been shooting at in this season. And so we'll come to the communion table together and remember the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to corporately look our eyes out at Christ and remember His sacrificial death on our behalf. And, and we need this ever before us. We're to, to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. We, we live into the reality of Christ, what He's purchased, and what we have now in union with Him. So I wanted to show you the, the beauty of what we do at the table this morning, the last time we partook of the table together, we looked at Exodus and, and we looked at, at the, the Passover lamb and how that, that lamb would be put over the lamp post and when the wrath of God would come, those firstborn children would be spared and the wrath would just pass over. And then Jesus is coming now and he sits down on that, that last supper and he, he changes that celebration and he moves it now to the remembrance of the, the Passover lamb that that was pointing to and the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And so we now come and we remember that Christ will pass over our sins because of the work he did on the cross. And then we come to 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul's explaining the table. And he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so the communion table has these beautiful two advents where we remember the, the Passover lamb, the fulfillment of Christ who came and died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. We're going to remember that today. And as we hold this cup and, and we, we eat the bread, we're going to be looking toward this next coming. Come, Lord Jesus, come back today. And so the, the communion table just lifts our hearts and reminds us what Christ has done. But what it's done is we're waiting for the consummation. Keep coming. We want you to return. And so at the second advent, we're going to move into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I've said this, every wedding has been pointing to this day, this celebration where we're going to finally everything be consummated and we enter in to this great supper with the Lamb of God. So don't miss this. Jesus came and he, he did the work of salvation and we are now betrothed to him. We are engaged to Christ. And then the king says he goes on a journey and he delays and it's been 2,000 years. And when he comes back, he comes to marry his betrothed. And he'll come and he'll take his bride into the marriage supper of the Lamb and we will celebrate like no other celebration in the history of the world. And so today we cry as the people of God, come Lord Jesus, consummate that today. We remember this morning with an eye to the marriage supper that he will come and consummate all things in himself. And so there's so much bound up in our remembrance 
this morning, I want your hearts to be full with this ordinance that Jesus has left for us. Today, we remember that our bridegroom paid a dowry for his bride. It cost his blood that was shed on Calvary's tree. He had to bow his head and give up his spirit. God himself had to die and be made alive. And now he cleanses his bride. He seeks to get her ready for the wedding day. He's purifying it. That's our passion and our prayer that everyone in this church is ready when the bridegroom returns. He's coming back. And so what a fitting way to end our series is you can't abide in Jesus Christ and not desire his return. Abiding in him makes you want his presence where every earthly pleasure you ever had or dreamed of will melt away into the presence of fullness and joy in him. So let's go to our king and let's pray. Father, thank you for the high holy day that the saints of God can come to the table and remember. We can remember our Paschal lamb. We can remember the blood that has been shed and put on our lamppost. It's been put over our hearts, God. And now when your wrath comes on the last day, it will simply pass us over. God, thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray this morning now, Lord, as we come to a sobering passage, I'm asking that you would work individually in each heart, God, that we would be awakened to the second coming and what you want us to learn from it. God, help us to quit trying to build kingdoms here, to build the, the kingdom of God. Lord, awaken us. We need awakening. We nibble too much at the table of this world, and many of us are cold and drowsy and apathetic to the things of God. We let lesser things take up our thoughts and affections. We get lost in the temporal. Oh God, would you lift our minds and our hearts to cry out this, this day, come, Lord Jesus. Let that be the defining point of our lives. Let that be the hope that we all share. God, I thank you for Jesus Christ. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. <clears throat> We're going to be looking at the parable of the ten virgins. I want to set the context. Matthew 24 is the famous Olivet Discourse by Jesus. Verse 3, the disciples asked Jesus, <clears throat> when are these things going to happen, the second coming? And what will be the sign in, in, in the end of the age? And when is this going to happen? And so Jesus then begins, begins to give them some signs of his return. <clears throat> and he says, false prophets and messiahs are going to come, and they're going to try to lead people astray. So don't get misled. Don't, don't be led astray by false teaching and lies. Then he says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars going on all around. Don't be frightened. He says that must take place. Nations are going to rise up against nations. And in various places, there's going to be famines and earthquakes. I don't know if you've studied the history of earthquakes, but the, the, the amount of rise in earthquakes in this world right now is astounding. And Jesus says, these are the birth pangs. These are the birth pangs of what's coming. They're going to deliver you to tribulation. They'll kill you, and you'll be hated by all the nations because of my name in this time. Many will fall away, they will betray one another, and they will hate one another, Jesus said. And he said, because in this time lawlessness is going to increase, most people's love will grow cold. And so as we live in this nation, the lawlessness is growing and filling up. And the saints of God, don't let your love grow cold and think that lawlessness is the norm and what God accepts. But the one who endures to the end, Jesus says, will be saved. The true believers will persevere to the very end and not be led astray and not let their love grow cold and go distant and go apostate. The real ones will make it to the end. Look at me in verse 14 of chapter 24. <clears throat> this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. Verse 21, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. And then in verse 27, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
Verse 30, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and with great glory. The second coming will be unmistakable. Don't get led astray, because you, 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 you will know. You will know. And then he warns us, you need to be ready for when this happens. Look at verse 36. But of that day and hour... No one knows, nor even the angels of heaven, nor the Son of Man, but the Father alone. Verse 42, <clears throat> therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Verse 44, for this reason, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Verse 50, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour which he does not know. There's going to be at a time that will be unknown and unexpected. It's a recurring theme throughout Scripture is this king is going to return and we need to be ready and we need to be prepared. I'm just praying that God will awaken every one of us to this truth and this reality. Thessalonians says it will be like a thief in the night when he comes. You don't expect it. And then after that, Jesus comes and breaks into a parable that we're going to look at this morning, and it is the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, verse 1, then the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> the word then is the, the second coming of our Lord. And so this parable now that he moves into is to teach us something really important about the return of Jesus Christ. There's something the bridegroom wants us this morning to get. His bride is dressed and ready, waiting, hastening, alert, and prepared for the bridegroom's return. To not be unprepared when the king returns is what he's warning us against. Don't be unprepared. So this is big this morning. May the Spirit give us ears to hear what the bridegroom tells his bride this morning. So I, I was thinking of the first coming all the prophecies and promises that Messiah was coming. It was the history of Israel. And right from the fall, that, that the seed of Adam would come and crush the serpent's head and reverse the curse. And it's just flushed out, the writer of Hebrews said, in many portions and in many ways throughout the whole Old Testament, down to the minutest details of the life of Jesus and prophecy. And sadly, Jesus comes and says, his own did not receive him. They, they, they were been waiting for thousands of years seeing him pictured and promised and he finally comes and they reject him and they don't receive the king of kings. With all the preparations for thousands of years, they missed Jesus. The religious who were looking for his coming daily like filling our land today missed their visitation when he came. Here's the bridegroom now teaching his followers again, saying, don't miss my second coming. Don't miss it. Be prepared and be ready, for it too will come at a time when you least expect it. But know this, it is certain. It will happen. But the time only the Father knows. And so this is the grand reality and truth that the people of God are to look for Every day of your life, we urge and we hasten it. Come, Jesus, come back and consummate this thing. So what I want to do then is let's go look at this parable together. And I've got probably the simplest outline I've ever had. So we're going to look at a wedding. We're going to look at some bridesmaids. We're going to look at a bridegroom. And then I'm going to give you a takeaway. And we're going to go to the Lord's table and remember our king. So as we begin, I thought what would be really important is to understand Jewish wedding in that day because it's different than when we think of our weddings. And I think we need to get that to understand the interpretation. <clears throat> so you will miss the truths of what this parable is teaching if we don't understand this. And so it, it's a big deal. So uh, wedding celebrations. I, I love weddings. I, I always have. I, I, just, I love watching friends and family and neighbors come together and celebrate with a couple of this beautiful moment in their life. And it's festive and celebratory. I, my favorite one I've ever been to was mine. I, I, I just remember I, I woke up and I was driving to the altar and, 
and everyone's driving by me, and I'm thinking, it's just another day for them. I'm going to get married. It was so overwhelming. And now I want to just look at the Jewish marriage. There were three parts to a wedding. And, and it will even help you understand Mary and Joseph's story. But first, the, there was the engagement, and it's a little different. This was a, an official contract, usually between the two fathers. So the, the two fathers would get together, and, and they would make this kind of this contract uh, for the marriage. So I, I'm all for returning to that. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. And then the second part is what's called the betrothal. And this was the official ceremony where the couple would make vows, and then they would be officially married afterwards. And this is when Paul said, hey, church, I betrothed you to one husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's this betrothal. And then for a year, the bridegroom would go and he would start getting things ready for the couple to move into a house and to live, to have land to work. And then after that, the bridegroom would come to take his bride to now move into that home. And that is what we see in our parable this morning, is we're looking at the third part of that ceremony, and it's the wedding feast. And this is when the bridegroom comes to the bride's house with, with all of his bridegrooms, and all the bridesmaids are there, and they come out, and they would go now through the city and parade through it, and they would do it at night with all their lamps, and just glorious and beautiful, and they would celebrate that the bridegroom is taking his bride into his home now. And so it was beautiful at night. They would celebrate then for seven days. Usually it could go sometimes as long as a month. And then at the end of it, everybody would leave. At least that was your prayer. And then the bride <laughs> and groom would begin their life together until death do they part. That's a Jewish wedding. And now the parable is going to make sense as we flow from that. So I just wanted you to have the, that, that wedding. Now let's look at the bridesmaids. <clears throat> Let's start with what and who do these, these bridesmaids represent? And so in verse 1, the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil and flask along with their lamps. And while the bridegroom was delaying, they got drowsy and began <coughs> to sleep. Sorry, the pollens are back up. I'm going to hack at you the whole, the whole morning, so hang with me. Um, so I want you to catch these virgins represent the, what we call the uh, invisible church and the visible church. And so today, the, the visible church is everyone sitting here right now. And the invisible church is everyone who's been born again sitting in here right now. And so the visible church is large all over this world. And the invisible church are the true ones who have been saved and joined to Jesus Christ. So as we begin to see this, I, I just want you to see what these virgins represent. They're the ain'ts and the saints, the professors and the possessors, the religious ones versus those who have a relationship with Christ and are abiding in Him, which has been our whole study for the last four months. That's why we've been studying it. Jesus told a parable, it's, it's going to be the wheat and tares, that someone was growing wheat, and during the night, someone came and, sp and sprinkled tares among the wheat, and they start growing up together, and they're like, what do we do? Should we try to separate them? And, and Jesus is saying, if you do, you'll hurt the wheat. And so just wait till judgment, and at judgment, I'm going to separate the, the, the tares and the wheat. And so there's, just, there's always going to be within the church those who are, who are real and know Jesus Christ and those who don't. And if I start trying to separate them, um, I'm going to hurt a lot of people. And so my professor at seminary said, preach in such a way that the wheat will grow and the tares will go. And so there's always going to be tares within church. When someone says, I can't believe someone acted that way, uh, you're always going to have unbelievers within the church. And so that's what this parable is talking about this morning. And their lamps represent professing Christians. We're, we're Christians. They're, they're all waiting for the bridegroom. This church is all over that the lampstand's gone, they're apostate, and they're celebrating this morning the return of Jesus Christ. They have a lamp, and they have an outward profession of faith. They've been baptized, and all they got was wet. 
They're part of the community. They're churchgoers. They have an external religion. They're believing that they're going to heaven when they die. And the statistics that fill our land are unbelievable. How many fill the church that don't even believe that Jesus is God? They don't even believe in the atonement. And they're just filling our land saying there's no doctrine, there's no truth anymore that makes someone a Christian. I just got a warm feeling in my heart. And that's what, what is all over. So a message like this in America is a powerful message. And I'm just asking that you would have ears to hear this morning that God wants to do business, I believe, in each one of our hearts with this parable. This is big. And it's not talked about enough in our day. But Jesus talked about it often. And really, this, this whole chapter of Matthew 25, he, he talks about a parable of talents. And, and did you use what I gave? And then the guy that just hid it in the sand, he's sent out into the eternal darkness. There's just two kinds of people in the church, ones who serve and the ones that do nothing. And then he goes to the sheep and the goats, two kinds of people. And the one, you know, when did I see you hungry and in prison and thirsty? And it's just the separation of the ones that had mercy and compassion and loved and served others and the ones that did not. So this whole chapter is about two kinds of people, dead religion and the ones that knew Jesus Christ. That is where he's going this morning. Jesus often boiled humanity down to these two groups. <clears throat> what have you done with Jesus Christ? It needs to be answered this morning. When he preached the Sermon on the Mount, the whole sermon was trying to show this, unless your righteousness surpasses the scribes and Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of God. This external religion, he just goes after and says that the real is the one who goes and prays in secret. He fasts so no one else will know. It, he, you just start seeing there's a difference between the dead external religion and the ones that I've been laboring for that abide in Jesus Christ and know him and love him and are seeking him. And he closes that sermon where he finally says, okay, it's make up your mind time on the mount now. What are you going to do with this preaching? There's a broad way that's external religion. You can live any way you want that leads to destruction and death. And there's a narrow way that you come in with no resources of your own and you look only to Christ for his righteousness and his salvation and his sufficiency. And he says many are going to go on the broad and only a few are going to go on the narrow. And then he says there's going to be false teachers. And these false teachers, you'll know them by their fruit. They're either going to produce good fruit or bad fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. And then there's these professions where uh, one's going to say, Lord, Lord, uh, didn't we do all these things in your name? They were preachers. Didn't we prophesy and cast out demons and do, do many miracles? And he's going to say, away from me, I never knew you, which is this whole study on abiding is that we know Christ. And on that last day, all they had was external religion. They were in the community and they did external things, but they didn't know Christ. And he's going to say, away from me, I never knew you. And then he says there's two foundations, one who builds on sand and one who builds on a rock, which is the one who hears the words of Jesus and obeys them. And the one, they, the both houses look the same, the invisible and visible church. Externally, they all look the same. And when the storms of life come, the one built on the sand falls and the one built on the rock will stand. This has been Jesus' message since he came to the earth. sobering. So let's look at the ten virgins in our parable. There are two groups. <laughs> I prayed for those with fledgling faith that God would protect you this morning and not throw you into despair. And I've prayed for the hard-hearted who no matter if I hit you with a club, you just sit there with this assurance that you can have dead religion and nothing will touch you. And I'm asking God to save you this morning. And so there's a balance. And God is the only one who can help us. I'm just going to give you the truth as clear as I know how to this morning. There's five who are wise, and there are five who are foolish. And five are going to go into the marriage supper of the Lamb, and five are going to be cast out into eternal darkness. Let's look at the lamps. 
The lamps were, they, they actually weren't lamps. Uh, this word was used in another place in, in the, in the uh, I can't remember where it was used. <clears throat> Only one other place, but it was a long pole. And it was a long pole, and it was more like a torch. And at the top of that pole, there was this mesh all around it. And inside that mesh, it was filled with cloth. And you would take that cloth, and you would just soak it in oil, and then you would light it. And you had a flaming torch so that you could go out into the night and it just would guide you to everywhere you needed to walk. And so these torches were a symbol that they belonged to the wedding party. They, they all went out to meet him. They were waiting for him. They're looking for him. And they all get up to go see the bridegroom. But Jesus now makes a delineation between the lamp carriers. Five are wise, five are foolish. They, again, they look the same on the outside. They all have the same dress on. They got their lamps. It just looks the same. But their hearts were very different. Five were prudent. Five were prepared. Five were ready for the coming of the bridegroom. And then five, the Greek word there is the word where we get moronic. It's where they're foolish. They're, they're, they're just foolish. What does that mean? Well, Jesus will flush it out in verse 3. <clears throat> For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in their flasks along with their lamps. So the wise, I want you to hear this, it's a preparedness for the return of the bridegroom. And I'm going to explain what that is. And the foolish, they're not ready. They have no oil. And the oil in the wise represents preparedness. So my question is, then how do I get prepared? I want to be the wise one. And it's what we studied for five years in Romans. The only way to get prepared is the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you realize there's nothing in you that can save you, your sin is deep, it's profound, and it's affected your whole being, and you can't change your nature, you can't clean up, and you come in desperation to Jesus Christ who has done the work to clean you up and wash you and cleanse you and set you free from the power and the dominion of sin. The way I get ready is through the gospel of Jesus Christ, not by trying to work this morning to fix yourself up. And then I get prepared by abiding in Jesus Christ, by living by faith in Him and drawing from His resources and who He is and his sufficiency and his power to live so that you might bear abundant fruit. Communion, confession, repenting, and believing all that we've been looking at. And love. Love caused Samuel Rutherford to, in prison to just cry out, come Lord Jesus, take large strides. I feel like I will die if I don't have your present love. You have a love as you abide in Christ that you long for this bridegroom to come back. I want to be ready. I don't want to let his delay rock me to sleep. Matthew 24, because of all the lawlessness in our land, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This is the one who's taken up in Christ. It's not dead external religion that has pr produced no love. And I just shepherd too much of that. Can't just be, I've got all the theology about end times. Do I know Christ? I grew up on this little kid song. Some of the older people will know it. I, I sung it to my daughter and she goes, I've never heard that song my whole life. Um, give me oil in my lamp, I pray. <laughs> Raise your hand if you know that song. Sweet, right crowd. Give me oil in my lamp. It's a little kid's song. And I was just thinking, that is brilliant. That's what this is saying. Give me oil in my lamp. I want to be prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. Verse five, while the bridegroom was delaying, that's the time we live in, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. They're drowsy and they're sleeping. Let's unpack this. I had this wrong in my own mind. It says that there will be a delay between his, his going up into heaven and his coming again to earth. And this delay has proven to be a stumbling block throughout church history. I'm just going to read you a passage from 2 Peter 3, 3. 
<laughs> know this first of all, just listen to this, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water, uh, Noah. But the present heavens and earth, by his word, are being reserved for fire and kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but He's patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance, to bring His people in. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. And since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what's, what sort of people ought you to be? What should this do to you? Argue over end times? Or to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, Come, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. You know what I call that? Oil in your lamp. Be found in that and regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Peter's bagging on them. Which the untaught and the unstable distort, as they do the rest of the Scriptures, to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand... Be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Abide in Him. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So in the delay, all ten sleep. And it finally hit me, sleep is not negative in this parable because they all, they all did it. So they all slept. Yet throughout church history, there are times where groups start to sit on the rooftop and they put on their pajamas and they're like, he's coming, he's, he's coming on October 10th. And they start telling us all these things. But what Jesus teaches throughout these parables is that we are to be waiting and working. I think Jason hit it when he was up here that while it's the day, let us work. This is the time to be laboring for God and his kingdom. And then at night, you know what you do? Instead of participating in their evil deeds, you sleep. There's nothing wrong with sleeping. I sleep to be refreshed, to work in the day. I just want you to catch this is how do I get prepared is my eyes are on the king and I'm serving him and I'm advancing his causes, not my own. I've told you my, one of my favorite quotes by Wesley is they, they said, Wesley, if, I think it was Charles, and he said, if the Lord was to return tonight, and you knew it, what would you do different? And he said, nothing. I'm going to go over to the prison, and I'm going to preach to those who are in bondage. Then I'm going over to the church, and I have a Bible study, and headed to the nursing home later tonight to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing will change, because I have oil in my lamp, and I serve the King of Kings, and that's what my life is about. And so if, if he comes back tonight and everything about your plans change, maybe something's wrong. That's what he's after. Preparedness for the turn of the king. I want to mention a little bit about the bridegroom thirdly. In verse 6, <clears throat> But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. He's here. Like a thief in the night, he comes at midnight. 
Do you remember when we studied Exodus? Listen to this. Now it came about in Exodus 12 at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. And it happened at midnight. And so here it comes, the the thief in the night coming at midnight, the bridegroom's here. And so let your lamps burn brightly to go out and meet him. Let your joy be full. Let your love be abounding. Let your peace be deep. Let your faith be strong and your hope certain and your praise of God and your wonder. Be ready. Have your lamps out. I'm waiting for King Jesus. I'm not just living in sin and darkness and debauchery saying, oh, I wish he'd come back, but not yet. I got to sow my oats before he comes back. This is going to happen. He's coming back, and the question this morning is, are you ready? Are you ready? Do you have oil? Do you just carry around a lamp? I carry my Bible. It's not changing me, but I carry it wherever I go. I carry my baptism card. Here it is. I carry my church attendance. I have all the external things of Christianity except beholding Christ and loving Him and knowing Him and abiding in Him and seeking to be holy in and through Him and to Him. Is this the chief end for all that you do and exist for? Come, Jesus. And to my own shame, I have lost this in ministry at times where I just get going through the motions. Awaken me, O God, and awaken your people. The marriage is the end game. For for most of us, since I've been in ministry, engagement is a hard season. You think that would be an easy season, but the planning, being apart, tired, arguing over your little list of what dishes you want and all that stuff. Um, Betrothal is not the end game. This consummation is. Let this invigorate your soul. Let it put oil in your lamp. Dressed in readiness when he comes back to bring us in. So the sleep is not the problem, but what awakens you when he comes? Are you ready? Or are you going to be caught in unexpectedness? Some of you younger people, one of the number one answers I've heard is I'm going to get saved later. I just want to go have fun. (laughs) I just want to enjoy my life. I'm telling you right now, there is no better, more joyful life than preparedness for Jesus Christ and knowing and loving him. Like, and, and, and then to presume that God won't give you over in your sin in Romans 1 is just bold. I'm going to do it at the end of my life. You know what your favorite word is? Tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll give my life. And so I want you to not be caught in unexpectedness when this happens like a thief in the night. Look at verse 7. Then all those virgins rose and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. We're not going to be able to do this. We can't see. But the prudent answered, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. This is big. Give us some oil. This isn't about selfishness. Like you could look and say, man, those five virgins were kind of selfish. Can't they spare a little bit of oil for those who have none? That, that's not it. What Jesus is showing you is salvation is not transferable. Salvation, it can't be transferred. I can't give my faith to you. I can't give my hope to you. I can't give my preparedness to you. I can't share the Holy Spirit for, with you. I can't share my union with Christ. I'm a branch attached to him. It's not transferable. If it was, I'd give it to you. So I want you to catch this, what he's saying. It's not your pastor's faith. It's not that you're a part of Southside Bible Church. It's not that your parents and your grandparents were amazing Christians. That doesn't get you prepared. That's not. It's, it's you. 
individually that has to get prepared. You alone must be ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care if your husband's a godly man. That's not going to get you in. I don't care, kids, if your parents are amazing. It's not transferable. It must be your salvation. you got to deal with your soul before God this morning. <clears throat> Verse 10. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. <clears throat> I think and those who were ready went into the wedding feast. That's the climax of your whole life, friends. This fight of faith is so worth it to not give up and keep being preparedness and laboring in this gospel. Don't grow weary. Don't get distracted. There's been more distractions the last year than I've seen since I've been a pastor on lesser things. Just listen to this phrase. What does it do to your heart? They went in with him. What is it you want from life? They went in with him. It's all I want. I've been meditating on that verse all week. They went in with him. Eternal bliss. That's what you get at the end of this. It's been a hard year. Why don't you walk away? This is why I can't walk away. I want each one of you to have this. They went in with him. That's what I labor for. I want each one of you to go in with him on that last day. And I'll fight you if I have to in your own sin. I can't bear to think of any of you having no oil in your lamp. That keeps me up at night. Look at verse 11. The door's shut. Makes me think a lot about Noah's Ark. When the storm starts coming and they're knocking on that ark going, let us in, and it's too late. The, the door's been shut. You're, you're not going into the wedding feast. It's shut. And later, the other virgins also came. And Matthew 7's jumping out of my head. Lord, Lord, Open up for us. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Lord, Lord, open up. And Jesus answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. And that's that Greek word again for intimacy. You didn't have communion with me. You didn't know me. You didn't abide in me. You had external religion your whole life. Jesus was some distant thing. You didn't know me. Can't you call me Lord, Lord. You go to church, take communion this morning, and it will not get you in. Do you know this Christ? That's what he's saying right here. Some of you have played with him for 20 years. And he's going to say, I don't know you. Door's shut. You never had a vine and a branch. So Jesus just says, be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Are you alert? If you knew he was coming back tonight, would you do anything different? Are you ready? Are you ready? That's what Jesus wants for you in this parable. And I'll tell you this, when he comes for his bride... And he takes us into his gardens and his chambers. Every pleasure we knew or dreamed of our whole life was but a shadow compared to what we will behold on that day. And they went in with him. That's how your life's going to end. Doesn't that make you want to be prepared? It just wake, it wakes you up. It's like smelling salt. May we come this morning and remember the Passover lamb 
who was slain on our behalf. And our coming consummation that is nearer than when we first believed. And may the table this morning give us preparedness to awaken us to the love of Christ and working in the waiting. Working in the waiting for King Jesus. Revelation 19, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, preparedness. And he said to me, right blessed, that you cannot be more blessed than those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. So as we close, COVID, man, it just put me into a slumber. It it affected my brain greatly, and I just, it was was just hard. If I had to give a word for it, I'd say drowsy, slumber. Slumber. And by grace and grace alone, when I went to New Zealand, he broke open and shed grace and light into my heart and mind. And he's done some great healing, and I feel like I've come out of a coma. And I think that season did a number on many of us. It just felt so dark, and there was that political and social unrest, and lawlessness has increased in our land greatly. And the signs of the end surround us on every turn. And so just this morning, has your love grown cold for this Christ? Has it made your love cold? Do you realize you will go in with him into the marriage supper of the Lamb? Be prepared, alert, ready, give me oil in my lamp. And Jesus said, you'll bear much fruit if you abide in me. And that's what the whole series has been about. I had a friend post this this morning or last night. He said, imagine if our Christian view of the end times was this. It was centered on preparing for Christ rather than the Antichrist. It was centered on the mark of the lamb rather than the mark of the beast. It was centered on preparing for redeeming the earth rather than escaping it. And it was centered on hope rather than fear. I pray that the second coming produces in us preparedness and we long for the return of our King. May he make us holy in the waiting. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this powerful parable that our King has told us. God, I pray that you would awaken us from drowsiness. There are some just leaning over the precipice, smiling, eating the world and drinking it and celebrating it and trying to get more of it. And they go to church and it makes them feel good, makes them feel safe. God, this parable pulls the rug out. I pray forever needed that rug out this morning by your grace that you would pull it out and that they would fall on the atonement of Jesus Christ. They would fall on the one who died in their stead so that he, you could draw near and have fellowship with him. You could have communion. You could be one with him and all his benefits now will be put to your account. God, thank you. I pray, produce communion in our hearts. Let us love the bridegroom and, and seek holiness and conformity to him to seek a, a kingdom that will be advanced and will snatch many out of the firebrands. God, awaken us. Help us not to think we have a lasting city here. Here we have no lasting city. Let us go outside the gate and suffer with King Jesus. Help us to quit trying to fit in and be accepted and get as much of our piece of the pie as we can get of America. God, cause us to die at the feet of Jesus, to be made alive in him, to to love him, to be invigorated by him, to, to be conformed to him, to have his power and his nearness God, awaken us from just cold, dead apathy. Do mighty things in Southside Bible Church so that you would get the glory by these lives. God, give spiritual smelling salts to every nose this morning and let it be the blood of Jesus Christ. And as we remember it now, let us be alive 
Let us be like Wesley that we will do nothing different today if you came back at the end. God, we live for that return. Thank you for the blessed hope that the, what we're about to remember is because of your work, one day we're going to go in with you to the marriage supper of the Lamb. God, thank you for this blessed hope. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.